I would say creativity is key. I can always find examples that tie to the subject that I'm teaching. In my research methods class, I started the quarter by introducing empirical studies. Empirical research methods in this country is really based on some sort of tradition that we need to have data collection, we need to have data analysis, and of course then at the very beginning of your project, you need to have a research question and hypothesis. Now, look at Samuel Morton's work in Crania Americana. So Morton was the person who have a huge collection of human skulls. He systematically categorized his data, big eye sockets, certain type of features, and then he found that People with thick lips usually are darker skinned people, lazy people, people who steal and immoral. However, that he found that people with a big eye socket, high nose feature, and lighter skin, blonde, blue eyes, those are the people who have good qualities, hardworking. They don't steal, they can colonize, they have this inner instinct of teaching other people and saving the savages. We are talking about data ca categorization, right? Certain things group under certain things, and we analyze, we see the final project. Now, what would you think about this and empirical method? Is it sound? Most students will say that it is sound because it follows all the procedures. But what are the implications here? What are the ethical implications here? And Morton's research methods give us the foundation of today's empirical studies. So then, um, in many ways, looking at all those daily life experiences that we have as a researcher and how we're going through reviewing journal articles, that is a way to balance that theory and practice. Yes, we learn about theory, but what are we practicing in our daily lives? Are we answering the question? How will we make the assumptions that, and another comment from an editorial board, um, Members, I cannot find enough people of color who have expertise to write about these subjects. It sends the messages to me that maybe the authors of color are not saying the things that you want to hear. So in many ways, this sort of engagement in self-reflexivity is the fundamental steps for social justice work. What is really satisfactory to me is that I'm able to make students feel uncomfortable in my classroom. When they get emotional, it is awesome. When they cry, I'm like, I've done what I can. To them, it is a whole new learning experience and to them, it is something to take away that they are being able to think about in the future when I see cases like this, when I when I see cases like this, I'm able to do something. Most of the time, people would say to me, what are you doing in your classes? You're just talking about examples and having all these like, tiny little things. Now, for many of my students, and especially in among the students on this campus where we're talking about 70, 75% of them who are whites, to be able to spend that 20 minutes in class and get grilled, they like the experience. They think that it is really, really worthy to be able to feel part of the lives of how minority are feeling in this country. And I think that that is very rewarding to them to be able to engage in education that they not only read the text, but they are able to emotionally engage in the lessons that they are learning to the students. And I think that one of the important things in the learning um, it's not just reading text and engaging in discussion. It's this emotional growth that is triggered by and powered by emotions where they feel like I do not need to know what and how I'm going to say it. I do not need to know the appropriate way of saying this. But when I see a person treating another person less, I am going to step in and be one of the person who participate in that conversation and change the situation. I would say I would never underestimate a spark that can burn down the entire building. It is all those tiny efforts that matter. So then, at the end of the course, I like to ask my students, how many people do you think I am? And my students will look at me like, mm, one, two. 
I'm like, no, just give me a quick answer. How many people do you think I am? And then they will be like looking at each other. I say, well, am I just one person? Have I affected you? Have I taught you something valuable that you think that you can move forward and make a change? Well, a majority of the class say yes. So how many people am I? The answer is you are infinity. And I think that that is the valuable part of being in a classroom, spending time with my students, learning from them. And that is the most rewarding part in my job when at the end of the day, I can go home and say that, oh, by the time I've spoken all about these issues and get so emotional with my students in the class, I can go back and snore in my bed. And as anyone who cannot sleep at night would agree, that a good night's sleep is better than none. And I am able to go to my bed and close my eyes and say, I have another day to look forward to.